No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infusoria under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older worlds of space as sources of human danger, or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible or improbable. It is curious to recall some of the mental habits of those departed days. At most, terrestrial men fancied there might be other men upon Mars, perhaps inferior to themselves and ready to welcome a missionary enterprise. Yet, across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds, as ours are to those of the beasts that perish, intellects, vast and cool and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. And early in the 20th century came the great disillusionment. And before we judge them too harshly, we must remember what ruthless and utter destruction our own species has wrought, not only upon animals, such as the vanished bison and the dodo, but upon its own inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the space of 50 years. Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? During the opposition of 1894, a great light was seen on the illuminated part of the disk, first at the Lick Observatory, then by Periton of Nice, and then by other observers. English readers heard of it first in the issue of Nature, dated August 2nd. I am inclined to think that this blaze may have been the casting of the huge gun in the vast pit sunk into their planet from which their shots were fired at us. Peculiar markings, as yet unexplained, were seen near the site of that outbreak during the next two oppositions. The storm burst upon us six years ago now. As Mars approached opposition, Lavelle of Java set the wires of the astronomical exchange palpitating with the amazing intelligence of a huge outbreak of incandescent gas upon the planet. It had occurred towards midnight of the 12th, and the spectroscope, to which he had at once resorted, indicated a mass of flaming gas, chiefly hydrogen, moving with an enormous velocity towards this Earth. This jet of fire had become invisible about a quarter past 12. He compared it to a colossal puff of flame suddenly and violently squirted out of the planet as flaming gases rushing out of a gun. And invisible to me because it was so remote and small, flying swiftly and steadily towards me across that incredible distance, drawing nearer every minute by so many thousands of miles, came the thing they were sending us, the thing that was to bring so much struggle and calamity and death to the earth. I never dreamed of it then as I watched. No one on earth dreamed of that unerring missile. That night, too, there was another jetting out of gas from the distant planet. I saw it. A reddish flash at the edge, the slightest projection of the outline just as the chronometer struck midnight. That night, another invisible missile started on its way to the Earth from Mars, just a second or so under 24 hours after the first one. Hundreds of observers saw the flame that night, and the night after, about midnight, and again the night after. And so, for ten nights, a flame each night. Why the shots ceased after the tenth, no one on Earth has attempted to explain. It may be the gases of the firing caused the Martians inconvenience. Dense clouds of smoke or dust, visible through a powerful telescope on Earth as little gray fluctuating patches, spread through the clearness of the planet's atmosphere and obscured its more familiar features. Even the daily papers woke up to the disturbances at last, and popular notes appeared here, there, and everywhere concerning the volcanoes upon Mars. 
The serial comic periodical Punch, I remember, made a happy use of it in the political cartoon. And all unsuspected, those missiles the Martians had fired at us drew earthward, rushing now at a pace of many miles a second through the empty gulf of space, hour by hour and day by day, nearer and nearer. Then came the night of the first falling star. It was seen early in the morning rushing over Winchester eastward, a line of flame high in the atmosphere. Hundreds must have seen it, taken it for an ordinary falling star. Albin described it as leaving a greenish streak behind it that glowed for some seconds. Denning, our greatest authority on meteorites, stated that the height of its first appearance was about 90 or 100 miles. It seemed to him that it fell to earth about 100 miles east of him. I was at home at that hour and writing in my study. And although my French windows faced towards Ottershaw and the blind was up, for I loved in those days to look up at the night sky, I saw nothing of it. Yet, this strangest of all things that ever came to earth from outer space must have fallen while I was sitting there, visible to me had I only looked up as it passed. Some of those who saw its flight say it traveled with a hissing sound. I myself heard nothing of that. Many people in Berkshire, Surrey, and Middlesex must have seen the fall of it, and at most have thought that another meteorite had descended. No one seems to have troubled to look for the fallen mass that night. But very early in the morning, poor Ogilvy, who had seen the shooting star and who was persuaded that a meteorite lay somewhere on the common between Horsell, Ottershaw, and Woking, rose early with the idea of finding it. Find it he did, soon after dawn, and not far from the sand pits. An enormous hole had been made by the impact of the projectile, and the sand and gravel had been flung violently in every direction over the heath, forming heaps visible a mile and a half away. The heather was on fire eastward, and a thin blue smoke rose against the dawn. The thing itself lay almost entirely buried in sand. Amidst the scattered splinters of a fir tree, it had shivered to fragments in its descent. The uncovered part had the appearance of a huge cylinder, caked over, and its outline softened by a thick, scaly, dun-colored encrustation. It had a diameter of about 30 yards. He approached the mass, surprised at the size, and more so at the shape, since most meteorites are rounded more or less completely. It was, however, still so hot from its flight through the air as to forbid his near approach. A stirring noise within its cylinder he ascribed to the unequal cooling of its surface, for at that time it had not occurred to him that it might be hollow. He remained standing at the edge of the pit that the thing had made for itself, staring at its strange appearance, astonished chiefly at its unusual shape and color, and dimly perceiving even then some evidence of design in its arrival. Then, suddenly, he noticed with a start that some of the gray clinker the ashy incrustation that covered the meteorite was falling off the circular edge of the end. It was dropping off in flakes and raining down upon the sand. A large piece suddenly came off and fell with a sharp noise that brought his heart into his mouth. For a minute he scarcely realized what this meant, and although the heat was excessive, he clambered down into the pit close to the bulk to see the thing more clearly. He fancied even then that the cooling of the body might account for this. But what disturbed that idea was the fact that the ash was falling only from one end of the cylinder. And then he perceived that very slowly the circular top of the cylinder was rotating on its body. It was such a gradual movement that he discovered it only through noticing that a black mark that had been near him five minutes ago was now at the other side of the circumference. Even then, he scarcely understood what this indicated, until he heard a muffled grating sound and saw the black mark jerk forward an inch or so. Then, the thing came upon him in a flash. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heaven, said Ogilvy, there's a man in it. Men in it, half-roasted to death, trying to escape. 
At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash upon Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. At that he stood, irresolute for a moment, then turned, scrambled out of the pit, and set off running wildly into Woking. By eight o'clock, a number of boys and unemployed men had already started for the common to see the dead men from Mars. That was the form the story took. I heard of it first from my newspaper boy about a quarter to nine when I went out to get my daily chronicle. I was naturally startled and lost no time in going out and across the Ottershaw Bridge to the sand pits. Going to the edge of the pit, I found it occupied by a group of about half a dozen men. The crowd about the pit increased and stood out black against the lemon yellow of the sky. As I drew nearer, I heard Stent's voice, keep back, keep back. A boy came running towards me. It's a movin', he said to me as he passed. A screwin' and a screwin' out. I don't like it. I'm a goin' home, I am. I went on to the crowd. There were really, I should think, two or three hundred people elbowing and jostling one another, the one or two ladies there being by no means the least active. He's fallen in the pit, cried someone. Keep back, said several. The crowd swayed a little, and I elbowed my way through. Everyone seemed greatly excited. I heard a peculiar humming sound from the pit. I say, said Ogilvy, help keep these idiots back. We don't know what's in the confounded thing, you know. I saw a young man, a shop assistant in Woking, I believe he was, standing on the cylinder and trying to scramble out of the hole again. The crowd had pushed him in. The end of the cylinder was being screwed out from within. Nearly two feet of shining screw projected. Somebody blundered against me, and I narrowly missed being pitched onto the top of the screw. I turned, and as I did so, the screw must have come out, for the lid of the cylinder fell upon the gravel with a ringing concussion. I stuck my elbow into the person behind me and turned my head towards the thing again. For a moment, that circular cavity seemed perfectly black. I had the sunset in my eyes. I think everyone expected to see a man emerge, possibly something a little unlike us terrestrial men, but in all essentials, a man. I know I did. But looking, I presently saw something stirring within the shadow, grayish billowy movements, one above another, and then two luminous disks like eyes, then something resembling a little gray snake about the thickness of a walking stick, coiled up out of the writhing middle and wriggled in the air towards me, and then another, a big grayish rounded bulk, the size perhaps of a bear, was rising slowly and painfully out of the cylinder. As it bulged up and caught the light, it glistened like wet leather. Two large, dark-colored eyes were regarding me steadfastly. The mass that framed them, the head of the thing, it was rounded and had, one might say, a face. There was a mouth under the eyes, the lipless brim of which quivered and panted and dropped saliva. The whole creature heaved and pulsated convulsively. A lank, tentacular appendage gripped the edge of the cylinder. Another swayed in the air. Those who have never seen a living Martian can scarcely imagine the strange horror of its appearance. The peculiar V-shaped mouth with its pointed upper lip, the absence of brow ridges, the absence of a chin beneath the wedge-like lower lip, the incessant quivering of this mouth, the gorgon groups of tentacles, the tumultuous breathing of the lungs in a strange atmosphere, the evident heaviness and painfulness of movement due to the greater gravitational energy of the earth. Above all, the extraordinary intensity of the immense eyes were at once vital, intense, inhuman, crippled, and monstrous. There was something fungoid in the oily brown skin, something in the clumsy deliberation of the tedious movements unspeakably nasty. Even at this first encounter, this first glimpse, I was overcome with disgust and dread. Suddenly the monster vanished. It had toppled over the brim of the cylinder and fallen into the pit with a thud like the fall of a great mass of leather. I heard it give a peculiar thick cry, and forthwith another of these creatures appeared darkly in the deep shadow of the aperture. I turned and running madly made for the first group of trees, perhaps a hundred yards away, but I ran slantingly and stumbling, for I could not avert my face from these things. And then, with a renewed horror, 
I saw a round, black object bobbing up and down on the edge of the pit. It was the head of the shopman who had fallen in, but showing as a little black object against the hot western sky. Now he got his shoulder and knee up, and again he seemed to slip back until only his head was visible. Suddenly, he vanished, and I could have fancied a faint shriek had reached me. I had a momentary impulse to go back and help him, that my fears overruled. The sunset faded to twilight before anything further happened. The crowd far away on the left towards Woking seemed to grow, and I heard now a faint murmur from it. And then, within thirty yards of the pit, advancing from the direction of Horsell, I noted a little black knot of men, the foremost of whom was waving a white flag. This was the deputation. There had been a hasty consultation, and since the Martians were evidently, in spite of their repulsive forms, intelligent creatures, it had been resolved to show them, by approaching them with signals, that we too were intelligent. Flutter, flutter, went the flag, first to the right, then to the left. It was too far for me to recognize anyone there, but afterwards I learned that Ogilvy, Stent, and Henderson were with others in this attempt at communication. This little group had, in its advance, dragged inward, so to speak, the circumference of the now almost complete circle of people, and a number of dim black figures followed it at discreet distances. Suddenly there was a flash of light, and a quantity of luminous greenish smoke came out of the pit in three distinct puffs, which drove up one after the other straight into the still air. This smoke, or flame perhaps would be the better word for it, was so bright that the deep blue sky overhead and the hazy stretches of brown common towards Chertsey, set with black pine trees, seemed to darken abruptly as these puffs arose and to remain the darker after their dispersal. At the same time, a faint hissing sound became audible. Beyond the pit stood the little wedge of people with the white flag at its apex, arrested by these phenomena, a little knot of small vertical black shapes upon the black ground. As the green smoke arose, their faces flashed out pallid green and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly, the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud droning noise. Slowly, a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out from it. It was sweeping round swiftly and steadily, this flaming death, this invisible, inevitable sword of heat. I perceived it coming towards me by the flashing bushes it touched, and was too astounded and stupefied to stir. I heard the crackle of fire in the sand pits, and the sudden squeal of a horse that was as suddenly stilled. Then it was as if an invisible yet intensely heated finger were drawn through the heather between me and the Martians, and all along a curving line, beyond the sand pits, the dark ground smoked and crackled. Something fell with a crash far away to the left, where the road from Woking Station opens out onto the common. Forthwith the hissing and humming ceased, and the black dome-like object sank slowly out of sight into the pit. It is still a matter of wonder how the Martians are able to slay men so swiftly and so silently. Many think that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the parabolic mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light but no one has absolutely proved these details. However it is done, it is certain that a beam of heat is the essence of the matter. Heat and invisible instead of visible light. Whatever is combustible flashes into flame at its touch. Lead runs like water. It softens iron, cracks and melts glass. And when it falls upon water, incontinently that explodes into steam. That night, Nearly forty people lay under the starlight about the pit, charred and distorted beyond recognition, and all night long the common from Horsell to Maybury was deserted and brightly ablaze. For my own part, I remembered nothing of my flight except the stress of blundering against trees and stumbling through the heather. All about me gathered the invisible terrors of the Martians. That pitiless sort of heat seemed whirling to and fro, flourishing overhead before it descended, 
and smote me out of life. I came into the road between the crossroads and Horsel and ran along this to the crossroads. I startled my wife at the doorway, so haggard was I. The dinner, which was a cold one, had already been served and remained neglected on the table while I told my story. There is one thing, I said, to allay the fears I had aroused. They are the most sluggish things I ever saw crawl. They may keep the pit and kill people who come near them, but they cannot get out of it. But the horror of them. Don't, dear, said my wife, knitting her brows and putting her hand in mine. A shell in the pit, said I. If the worst comes to the worst, we'll kill them all. So you have the state of things on Friday night. In the center, sticking into the skin of our old planet Earth like a poisoned dart, was this cylinder. But the poison was scarcely working yet. The milkman came as usual. I heard the rattle of his chariot, and I went round to the side gate to ask the latest news. He told me that during the night the Martians had been surrounded by troops, and that guns were expected. Then, a familiar reassuring note, I heard a train running towards Woking. About six in the evening, as I sat at tea with my wife in the summer house, talking vigorously about the battle that was lowering upon us, I heard a muffled detonation from the common, and immediately after a gust of firing. Close on the heels of that came a violent, rattling crash quite close to us that shook the ground, and starting out upon the lawn, I saw the tops of the trees about the Oriental College burst into smoky red flame, and the tower of the little church beside it slide down into ruin. The pinnacle of the mosque had vanished, and the roof line of the college itself looked as if a hundred-ton gun had been at work upon it. One of our chimneys cracked as if a shot had hit it, flew, and a piece of it came clattering down the tiles and made a heap of broken red fragments upon the flower bed by my study window. I and my wife stood amazed. Then I realized that the crest of Maybury Hill must be within range of the Martians' heat ray, now that the college was cleared out of the way. At that, I gripped my wife's arm, and without ceremony, ran her out into the road. Then I fetched out the servant, telling her I would go upstairs myself for the box she was clamoring for. We can't possibly stay here, I said, and as I spoke, the firing reopened for a moment upon the common. But where are we to go, said my wife in terror. I thought, perplexed. Then I remembered her cousins at Leatherhead. Leatherhead, I shouted above the sudden noise. She looked away from me downhill. The people were coming out of their houses, astonished. Leatherhead is about twelve miles from Maybury Hill. The scent of hay was in the air through the lush meadows beyond Pyreford, and the hedges on either side were sweet and gay with multitudes of dog roses. The heavy firing that had broken out while we were driving down Maybury Hill ceased as abruptly as it began, leaving the evening very peaceful and still. We got to Leatherhead without misadventure about nine o'clock, and the horse had an hour's rest while I took supper with my cousins and commended my wife to their care.